So I got up at 4 a.m. this morning for a, a UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change meeting, and part of that meeting, it's pretty intense discussions, is taking this 700-page report that we've worked on over the last two years and distill it into 10 pages of policy takeaways. And I gotta say, this has been a much more fun environment to be in than that <laughs> meeting this morning. It's been great to have in person rather than Zoom, but it's also been really encouraging to see activists and policymakers and practitioners talking about what we can do um, as well. But I'll say one observation I've had from this engagement with the UN IPCC is there really is a struggle there between people that I would classify as the optimists, I'm in that camp, and others that I might classify as pessimists, or they might call themselves realists. And that's something that's really been a struggle in the messaging of that report, and will probably affect how it turns out. So there are certain things where, for example, there are 24 countries that have reduced their emissions over a long period of time, over 10 years, at rates that are exactly what we need to get to net zero emissions by 2050. So that's really good news. But there's also 170 other countries whose emissions have grown and offsets the reductions in those 24 well-performing countries. And there's example after example like that where we have good news, yeah, but. And that's kind of what we've tried to struggle with in the report. And the, what I've kind of realized that you have to hold both of those, that both are true and the way we've put it in the report is we're gonna have signs of progress and continuing challenges. And there's lots of evidence on both columns for those. And the way I would just sum it up is that the climate problem is getting worse, but the solutions have gotten much better. And both of those things are true. One thing the optimists and the realists really do agree on though is urgency. And I have to say that there's consensus that by mid-century, which is less than 30 years away, we need to get our emissions pretty close to zero in order to avoid dangerous anthropogenic climate change. So there's this need for a massive transformation of the system, and there's thus this need for urgency. And I have to say that's probably the point that I noticed was really missing in today. I think we've got a lot of potential, a lot of solutions, but they're not all connected to this need to get to zero in less than 30 years, and that there's a lot of urgency associated with that. And I think as we go forward, what that means for me is that we need more work, we need more effort, we need more people working on it, and especially we need more different types of people working on this problem. So continuing the theme of urgency, of optimists and solutions, I get to introduce our afternoon speaker. And so I wanna welcome back to Madison, Dr. Catherine D. Huff. Catherine is ex Acting Assistant Secretary and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the US Office of Nuclear Energy in the US Department of Energy. She joined the office in May, 2021 after serving as an Assistant Professor in the Department of Nuclear, Plasma and Radiological Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she's been since August 2016. She previously led the Advanced Reactors and Fuel Cycles Research Group and was a Blue Waters Assistant Professor with the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. I wanna let everyone know there are closed captions available at the URL that's on your table there. And now I wanna turn it over to Dr. Huff. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Nemet. Um, it is an honor for me to be here today. Hello, everyone. Um, in addition to all of those things, I am a proud Badger alumna. I did my PhD here in the nuclear engineering department, and I learned some things about energy policy from some of the professors in this room. Uh, so it's my distinct honor to be giving the closing keynote. Uh, today's really thought-provoking and critically important discussions. Um, <laughs> I'll start with U.S. climate policy. U.S. climate policy is informed by science, and as Professor Nemet just noted, uh, the science is clear. Um, there, it is code red right now. Uh, total climate crisis, and the alarm bells are ringing 
This echoes President Biden and Secretary Granholm's uh, feeling on this topic. President Biden bought, uh, brought the U.S. back into the Paris Agreement on his very first day in office. The U.S. is all in. The president announced that we need to promote a substantial increase in our Paris Agreement emissions reduction target, the nationally determined contribution to bring it up to 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels in time for 2030. Uh, but unless we bring the rest of the world with us, we're not going to be able to mitigate the climate crisis. More than 85% of greenhouse gas emissions driving the planet's warming come from beyond our borders. As was just discussed, this is a figure that is forecast to rise as emerging economies lead global emissions growth. And the administration believes that U.S. climate leadership is really more necessary and urgent than ever. We need to combat this climate crisis both at home and abroad. And it's really an integral part of our foreign as well as our domestic policy moving forward. And that's why President Biden has convened 40 world leaders at the Leaders Summit on, on Climate last April. It's also why he took an unprecedented step of appointing a special presidential envoy for climate, uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry to lead our climate diplomacy, as well as former EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy as our national climate advisor. President Biden has laid out the boldest climate agenda in our nation's history. The United States leadership is critical for catalyzing effective Paris Agreement implementation globally, and success is going to be measured by the number of countries that adopt and implement policies that are necessary to achieve these ambitious greenhouse gas reduction goals. Falls upon us. I'm pleased to see the leaves turning here in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and it is time for COP26, which is upon us. And as we look towards that event, we expect to work with other countries to ensure that our policies do have a successful outcome, both here and abroad. Now I'll turn a little bit, with your permission, to nuclear energy. I, of course, lead the Office of Nuclear Energy inside DOE, and I had the opportunity earlier today to sneak into your, you, you, your breakouts. Uh, I listened in on some of the utility discussion as well and found it interesting, uh, very deeply interesting. Um, you know, but I didn't hear a lot of mention of nuclear, at least in the pieces that I was in, and so I hope to be able to speak to you a little bit about that today and leave you with a little thought on the role for nuclear in our climate goals. Uh, here at home, President Biden has pledged to do everything possible to power a country with clean energy, and that includes every clean energy option available. So let there be no doubt, carbon-free nuclear energy is absolutely vital to our achieving our decarbonization goals. Nuclear energy working in tandem with other energy sources is really the only way to reach our ambitious goals of 50% of or more reduction in our carbon emissions by the end of the decade, as well as 100% clean electricity generation by 2035 and a net zero economy by 2050. That's because nuclear produces one third of the world's non-emitting electricity. In the US, nuclear contributes more than half of our clean electricity. It also operates reliably 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And here in Wisconsin, nuclear energy provides 16% of the state's electricity, but 73% of the state's carbon-free electricity. So not to be overlooked, uh, it also provides jobs. Wisconsin's Point Beach nuclear plant employs 700 workers. Beyond providing clean heat and electricity and jobs, nuclear power can also enable variable renewable energy. It can support the production of life-saving medical isotopes. It can drive industrial processes that require heat, which can be challenging with other utility scale renewables. It can produce hydrogen um, in the most efficient ways that combine both thermal and electric energy. Uh, and that can, of course, be used for transportation and industrial products. And nuclear heat can also be used to desalinate and purify water. Our focus on nuclear energy isn't just talk. The DOE's Office of Nuclear Energy, which I'm privileged to lead, serves a vital role in addressing these challenges. And our scientists and engineers working in tandem with researchers from universities like this one, the national laboratories, and in many cases in partnership with industry, are engaged in research, development, and demonstration activities that will allow the full potential of nuclear energy systems to be realized for the good of humanity. For starters, 
We are focused on preserving the absolutely vital clean air benefits of our existing nuclear fleet. Every time one of these reactors shuts down, that's half of a percent of our clean electricity gone. A full gigawatt is not the kind of clean electricity capacity that we need to lose today. We need to keep those existing plants open. We're making today's nuclear fleet a priority by requesting funding to increase the cost effectiveness of their operations and maintenance, and that includes developing and deploying new and improved fuels to enhance their performance, reduce their costs. DOE is also working with existing nuclear facilities to increase their revenue opportunities in markets beyond electricity, where they don't necessarily have to compete with renewables on the grid, but instead uh, can produce clean non-electric products such as hydrogen that require their unique capability to produce direct heat. We're also very excited to look ahead to the next generation of nuclear energy technologies. In my previous life as a professor, of course, my research was in advanced reactors and their fuel cycles. Uh, and I'm excited to say that they're a very real possibility today. It's time to shift nuclear research development and demonstration into total hyperdrive. And hand in hand with our industry partners, we really can deploy new advanced products while ensuring the env environmental stewardship of our planet. And with support from the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program within the DOE's Office of Nuclear Energy. Uh, the U.S. industry really stands at the forefront of innovation in nuclear. Today, we have more U.S. companies than ever developing advanced nuclear reactor designs, and they have the potential for greater flexibility. Um, they have different sizes and operational capabilities, and um, ultimately, this makes them more affordable to build and operate and also more flexible in collaboration with renewables. These concepts are very real. They're ready to deploy, and they are ready to support a variety of energy demands and applications. And of great interest to the administration and to me, they can potentially be located at retiring coal plant sites using the infrastructure and ex the skilled workforce that already exist in those locations. Much like a lot of renewable energy sources are contemplating today, we have one of our advanced reactor demonstration program awardees, TerraPower, leading the charge here. Um, this has been their plan. They plan to site their natrium sodium cooled fast reactor, which my office is 50% funding, at a retiring coal plant in Wyoming. Um, this is huge. We're committed to this project and we look forward to seeing this transition from coal to nuclear much more broadly. We're also thrilled to support the demonstration of the X Energy XE100, which is a small modular high temperature gas reactor. It's a pebble bed reactor, very cool. And it's planned for demonstration in Washington state. And both of these demonstrations will be operational by 2028 to help us decarbonize our electric sector, power our clean energy future, and continue supporting good paying energy jobs. Now, I'm at the University of Wisconsin, so I get to talk a little bit here about the importance of the University of Wisconsin in the context of nuclear energy. You know, whether we're talking about preserving the existing fleet or developing new advanced reactor technologies, Wisconsin is a really important partner. Over the last dozen years, UW has been awarded more than $50 million through various Office of Nuclear Energy programs, and it's helped the university upgrade R&D capabilities at the reactor and develop new fuels through the Accident Tolerant Fuels Program, uh, as well as support different aspects related to the development of advanced reactors and their fuel cycles. So over the years, support for the next generation of scientists and engineers was also provided through a bunch of scholarships and fellowships. And, you know, it's really an honor to be back here in a place that's performing so well in the context of our nation's nuclear energy mission. And uh, the University of Wisconsin is really uh, a prime mover in this area. So you should be very proud. Um, now, I just got back from a, a big trip, and so let's briefly head to the international stage that matters so much. Uh, with a focus on nuclear energy's role in climate diplomacy, it's important to know that many countries see nuclear energy as a really important option that can add reliability, diversity, and energy security to their portfolios. We also know that many countries are turning to nuclear energy to meet their energy growth needs and to support nationally determined contributions under the Paris agreements and to seize these kind of climate and clean energy opportunities. We're continuing to work with our international energy partners while also developing new and enhanced strategic relationships. And our international cooperation generally includes things like research and development, technical assistance, um, investments from US national laboratories and various federal agencies towards uh, initiatives abroad. 
we work with the Department of Commerce, for example, to convene roundtables and business to business meetings that tend to connect US companies to key decision makers and project managers and developers, as well as foreign buyers of new technology that can help decarbonize those nations. And, you know, in doing so, we not only support global efforts to combat climate change, but we also enhance the ability of our innovative US technologies, um, including zero carbon, uh, nuclear energy technologies to capture shares of future markets around the world. And this gives us an opportunity to serve more as a role model and to share our expertise in nuclear safety regulation. We are the best in the world at nuclear safety, by the way. Uh, and with respect to nuclear nonproliferation and security to expand a safe and secure uh, nuclear energy industry worldwide. So, you know, just two weeks ago, I had the honor of accompanying the Secretary of Energy, uh, Jennifer Granholm, to the ministerial level partnership for the Transatlantic Energy and Climate Cooperation meeting, for example. This was in Warsaw. It's called PTAC. Um, and it includes the U.S. as well as 22 European countries, mostly uh, from Eastern Europe, as well as the European Union itself. And it focuses on technical collaboration on a bunch of key areas across energy, uh, improving energy efficiency and clean energy deployment, renewable energy, nuclear energy, carbon management. And it intends to promote new capital investment in key energy infrastructure. Um, and that includes things like climate impact prediction, risk mapping, adaption planning, and um, supporting energy cybersecurity best practices. Uh, we also talked about providing analysis and vulnerability assessments for electricity and gas transmission systems, but also the future of nuclear energy in many of these nations. The secretary worked tirelessly with our public and private sector partners and potential international partners to align our interests around the innovation and deployment of clean energy technologies urgently as soon as possible because it's code red and a climate crisis for humanity. And so part of that was to advocate for the deployment of nuclear energy technologies from the United States as a flagship for innovative clean energy solutions. And she did a terrific job. And the secretary's goal was really to enhance our energy, environmental, and eco economic diplomacy efforts that really underpin this climate battle. I was really honored to be part of that effort. And I think as we look towards the urgency and the international nature of this challenge, I think it's events and activities like this that the US government relies on to ensure that we do have some influence on the future of the clean energy transition worldwide. Anyway, this important meeting is gonna continue the global conversation on all kinds of energy, but includes nuclear energy and its role for meeting energy demand where, you know, for example, um, you know, natural gas may not be the right option for them in support of their uh, varying renewables. So the ministerial also provided a real opportunity to showcase the US nuclear industry in that context. So I just, I wanted to share that. Um, I'll just say, you know, it's really lovely to be back here today. The La Follette School clearly brought together some really varied interests from this Wisconsin community, and I was so pleased to see uh, so many voices, policymakers, uh, young policymakers, uh, researchers, community leaders, public utilities, you know, for a really multifaceted discussion on this climate issue, all of those voices are needed, just like all technical solutions are also needed. Um, the secretary likes to say there's no sil silver bullet. We're working with silver buckshot at this point. Uh, and so I know our discussions were fruitful. I was pleased to hear a few of them. And I hope that, you know, as I stand here, not just at the conclusion of the Climate Policy Forum, but at the beginning of an open dialogue, that these will lead to some productive actions, real meetings that advance our interests in an urgent fashion. And whether we're talking about developing and uh, pursuing innovative solutions locally, domestically, internationally. Uh, we have a lot to do to ensure that the transition to a clean energy economy is more inclusive and equitable. And without, you know, while not without challenges, uh, Wisconsin and the United States um, and the world have a lot to gain in this transition. And together, we really need to make sure that the clean energy transition lifts up communities by preserving natural resources, using less land to minimize our impact, providing equity and electricity access, as well as high paying long-term union, dare I say, jobs. Nuclear energy's full clean energy potential is an important part of this energy transmission, just like renewables and other clean energy sources. And so in closing, I'll just say the only way we're gonna finally get our arms around this climate crisis is together. Um, so let's get to it on Wisconsin.
Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Huff. And I was so excited to introduce you and hear what you had to say. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Greg Neman. I'm a professor at the La Follette School of Public Affairs. But I was really uh, also excited to hear you focused on the urgency aspect of it. And I can see how you're talking about we've got the 2035 goals, 2050 goals. Um, but you know, also we've got this historical record in nuclear of it taking a long time to get things. And so when people think about urgency, that may not be the first item they think about, nuclear power, although as you say, it's half of our clean energy today. What do you see as kind of the, maybe the lessons from nuclear siting and timing in the past that we could do better at if we look forward the next 10 or 20 years? Oh, there are a hundred lessons <laughs> learned from the mistakes of the past. And I think, um, a couple of key pieces are, um, you know, we will be opening or at least connecting to the grid two new large scale nuclear plants in the United States this year. Um, at the Vogel plants, they're turning on two AP 1000s in the late winter and the early spring at the, that are coming up. And, uh, you know, that represents two gigawatts of clean electricity that will finally be online, but it's over schedule and well beyond budget. And so what, is that, what story does that tell? Well, I think one of the lessons learned there is that you know, we in the nuclear industry have historically built reactors like airports rather than like airplanes. And as we look towards newer technologies, many of them are quite a bit smaller and potentially could be produced in a factory or at the very least assembled from factory built parts on site rather than being sort of uh, boutique uh, ad hoc kind of uh, building of a reactor on site with a, like really like an airport rather than an airplane. So this is one of the key pieces is size. I think factori factoryizing some of these technologies is going to really help. And the newest nuclear reactor to be licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is of this type. It's called New Scale, and it's a real shrunk down version of the historic light water reactors that we've been building. Um, and it is built from factory available parts and assembled. And the idea is that it is modular and small. So we call them small modular reactors. And there's a lot of interest in these internationally as well as domestically because there is this potential to learn from those lessons of the past. Well, maybe just following up on that. So one of the things that I noticed today is I don't think I heard the word nuclear power uh, in our discussions today. We heard a lot about wind and solar, and part of the story there is modularity, is small scale and putting lots of units together. And you're starting to say maybe there's a nuclear story that looks like that. You've talked about it more from the supply side or the production side that might be cheaper and more efficient and mass produced. Um, is there anything that we get that we, from these smaller scale in terms of a service that we don't get from the typical large ones that we are used to doing? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you guys talked a little bit about distributed energy systems in some of your conversations today. And I think as we think about the resilience around the grid, not only is it helpful to have the kind of energy source that doesn't need fuel all the time, like a renewable or a nuclear reactor, right? Nuclear reactors aren't refueled very often. It, they last for a really long time. In addition to that resilience, it's helpful potentially to have distributed energy sources and distributed grids, possibly on microgrids. And small and micro reactors are really um, a great opportunity for that. Everywhere we currently have diesel backup, fossil diesel is there for its reliability and its availability at a certain scale at any time, right? There are very, very small scale micro reactor designs ready for commercialization and deployment that are very much on that scale. They have the same kind of reliability and modularity. And if they can be commercialized in the rapid near term, then we can see some applications there for them, just for example. And I think, I think that kind of gets to, you know, this question around sort of what it looks like uh, sort of in the broader sense for these markets of, you know, different kinds of reactors. Okay. And when you were mentioning earlier what these reactors can do, they produce electricity like other technologies do. Um, but you also mentioned heat and potentially really high temperature heat. And you, I think you said the word hydrogen too. And how does that work? Like how do we, because you're in the Office of Nuclear Energy, is hydrogen part of the Office of Nuclear Energy or is it somewhere else? Like how do we get those two things to be developed together or to have a system that works for both? 
This is a great story for like working across the stovepipes of the Department of Energy. The Office of Nuclear Energy and the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy have together awarded a handful of nuclear hydrogen demonstrations, which are beginning already. Many of them were awarded last year and continue to be awarded in the near term. And those uh, nuclear energy demonstrations of hydrogen production are at existing nuclear reactor sites. And that's really cool, but right now they're mostly uh, electrolysis based. Advanced nuclear reactors also offer the opportunity, because they have very high temperatures um, in general, to leverage some of the most efficient ways that you can make hydrogen. So this includes high temperature electrolysis as well as thermochemical methods like iodine sulfur cycles and things like this. Very few other energy sources are capable of producing really large utility scale high temperatures, right? And so nuclear is definitely the cleanest of these large utility scale high temperatures and can leverage that heat towards the most efficient production of hydrogen, which may very well get us to the hydrogen earth shot that the department is collectively working towards. So in addition to EERE and NE working together in these demos, we are also working together, in addition to working together with the Fossil and Carbon Management Office, which is no longer just the Fossil Energy Office, but now Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, uh, which is kind of great because it gets to refocus on carbon mitigation. Uh, anyway, we're collaboratively working along with lots of other offices within DOE on this hydrogen earth shot. We are aiming to get to one kilogram of clean hydrogen for $1 in one decade. And what that means is that we all need to make hydrogen production cheaper. And so we need the most efficient hydrogen production methods to be part of that solution, including thermochemical cycles like the ones uh, unleashed by nuclear power. That's really encouraging to hear about this cross office collaboration. You can see what, and can you just uh, uh, elaborate a bit about why we, what we would use hydrogen for? Oh, this is so great. So you can use hydrogen for like a ton of stuff. You can use hydrogen to put back into a fuel cell and make electricity. You can use hydrogen to burn in a blast furnace to reduce iron in the steel making process. This was recently, I guess, demonstrated by Arcelor Mittal. Um, anyway, there's a lot of applications for it, but I think there's a ton, especially in the context of transportation, like with fuel cell batteries, you can use hydrogen as a fuel instead of fossils in this context for the future of vehicles, particularly right now at the like medium to heavy scale kind of machinery, but soon in, in personal vehicles, no doubt. Okay. And so thinking about collaborating with different parts of the Department of Energy, that's really helpful to have the hydrogen example. I think we've also seen, though, how nuclear competes with these other technologies. And we've seen maybe low natural gas prices, which maybe we're entering our, a realm where we don't have that anymore. But in the past, that seems to have been a reason why nuclear, some nuclear plants had closed. And then we've got wind and solar becoming cheaper and kind of creating the same downward price pressure. How, how can nuclear be set up so that it functions in the way you suggest where it complements the downsides of wind and solar, that it's not windy and sunny all the time, but you can have nuclear when you need it, and not be just competing with them for the cheapest one kind of takes over? Yeah, I think, you know, this is tied to things like hydrogen, certainly. And the, the demos, for example, in the context of these, you know, nuclear reactors tied to um, electrolysis plants that we're, um, that we're demonstrating, allow nuclear to lower the amount of electricity that it puts on the grid by instead offsetting it by producing hydrogen with that electricity at times of low demand. Now, that's still sort of, you know, and from a pi pricing scheme, the pricing dynamics still allow that to make the like price of electricity go down, but you're no longer on a grid where the variability of renewables requires additional natural gas backup. It allows nuclear, a clean, reliable technology to be the backup, right? Which is certainly better than an emitting fossil fuel, no matter how clean natural gas may be. Uh, ultimately, that kind of variability and load following capability that's enabled by things like hydrogen or advanced reactors that themselves can change in power a little more flexibly, which is the case, by the way. New reactors will not have this sort of constant base load uh, challenge. Many of them can load follow a little better. Anyway, being able to load follow a little better alongside renewables should allow support from nuclear for renewables that should displace some of that natural gas. Right. Okay. And then just turning from the U.S. to the more international realm, 
Uh, you talked about this interesting trip to Poland, and we've got you know multiple important international events coming up, like the Glasgow Climate Conference starts in less than four weeks. What's been the reception to the U.S.'s kind of pushing with Senator Kerry on climate, and then talking about nuclear in particular? How do what do you see as the reaction from the rest of the world? Um, Certain parts of the rest of the world really need nuclear in a particular way. I would say, um, you know, in particular in nations where natural gas may be weaponized and politically, uh, it's not an option to sort of look towards variable renewables with backup of natural gas. Instead, they need to look towards potentially renewables plus a backup of nuclear. And so a lot of those nations, particularly in the sort of P-TECH set, which a lot of are, are Eastern European, you know, are in a position where natural gas has been politically weaponized. And I think, you know, we get a lot of positive reception from those nations. Poland, for example, has a strong interest in building these new APP-1000 reactors that are this U.S. technology that are being turned on in uh, Georgia in a few months. That is a traditionally sized, gigantic type of device, but they are they're in need of a baseload energy source that is securely Polish and uh, like inside their borders. And uh, I think it's a really promising area. Now, not all nations are in that position. Some nations are very comfortable with, you know, other types of hybrid energy sources. But I think um, most nations are that we've encountered, you know, there's a lot of excitement about the possibility of new nuclear reactor designs coming out of the United States where there's a gold standard for safety. Um, and I think, you know, we're really looking at a place where the Secretary of Energy is speaking clearly about the need for nuclear as part of the solution. Um, and I think that really helps um, in these kind of larger scale international climate discussions to set the tone for how urgent climate really is. You can't throw away any of these possible options. Yeah, th that's really interesting about natural gas prices because in the U.S., that's been such a defining aspect of the energy system for the last 10 or 15 years has been really low natural gas prices and a problem for nuclear. But yet we seem to be getting into this era where the rest of the world is facing particularly potentially really high natural gas prices, including connected to ge geopolitical objectives as well. So there may be a role for nuclear in that as well. Um, one more question, then I want to turn it over to the audience. Um, so this is kind of a more general question. So you got interested in nuclear power at some point and have made a career out of it and now are at the Department of Energy working on it. What do you say to people that uh, are interested in this climate problem, maybe they're interested in nuclear or just in the solutions in general, see the urgency, but don't know where to start. What, what's your advice to, to people like that? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, I would say it's really important that we look not just to electricity, but other applications and our use of energy in other areas, transportation in particular, but also industrial uses of heat for the generation of chemicals, for, for the generation of fertilizer, very important to a place like Wisconsin. You need hydrogen to make ammonia. The like Haber-Bosch process is very like energy intensive. Like how, how do you make sure that we decarbonize all sectors of, of the you know carbon emissions on our planet? Decarbonizing everything is kind of the next step once we get to this net zero place. I think people who are just beginning their careers are gonna face a long series of decades where we are attempting to decarbonize everything else as well. Great. I could keep asking questions, but I feel greedy doing it. So I'd like to turn it over to the audience to, uh, to raise your hands for questions. And we have uh, people with mics to bring that. I see a couple over in the back over there. Okay, I'm just gonna speak, oh, there, there it goes. Go. Um, hi, my name is Michaela Caliche. I'm a student here at UW, um, and I appreciate you coming to speak. I have a question about um, the public, of, public opinion of nuclear, which has not always been favorable in the US. I'm wondering what the Office of Nuclear Energy is doing to consider public perceptions of nuclear as these new nuclear technologies are being developed and hopefully will be deployed in our communities? Ah, this is such a great question. So we are in a great time where the like importance of climate 
crises facing us um, has re-inspired a few people to reevaluate the role of nuclear, and it is more bipartisan, and the public is much more accepting of nuclear than they were in the past. And in part, potentially, that's because of generations uh, like my own that are not saddled with the sort of memory and baggage of more weapons-related nuclear activity. You know, I think it's a very different we, we see a much clearer line between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons than potentially previous generations. Now, we can't just rely on that, though. In the Office of Nuclear Energy, it's our job to ensure that the perception matches the truth. And uh, some of the things that we're also doing is um, improving the truth. So uh, the president is very serious about social justice, in particular energy justice and environmental justice. And inside the Department of Energy, especially inside the Office of Nuclear Energy, we're incorporating important parts of our processes. We're bringing in, we have working groups on energy justice and we have procedural justice ideas around making sure that our processes can instill more trust in the public, like, or rather in the government from the public. Um, and we're evaluating the way that we spend our money. Is it benefiting the communities that were historically underserved by our technology? And what can we do to recognize that in all of our processes, our decisions, our transactions, our grants, mm -hmm. our choices, our communications? And as we approach this sort of energy justice as a part of the like whole of the Department of Energy, the Office of Nuclear Energy has a lot of trust to rebuild. And so as we sort of improve the truth, we can also improve the perception of the truth in the public. And, and I think we're, we have a lot of trust um, from you know, legacy waste from the weapons program that the commercial nuclear industry has to answer for, despite being like quite a different sort of um, pathway. Anyway, that's what we're attempting to do. Uh, things like, for example, I'm in my personal sort of mission here in the Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy, one of my three major priorities is to um, manage our spent nuclear fuel uh, appropriately and that means restarting a consent-based process for siting an interim storage facility and reevaluating the legal framework around our regulatory system for the spent nuclear fuel repository future so that we can decouple ourselves from Yucca Mountain, which is not on the table. Well, that's a much broader set of uh, factors than I would have expected <laughs> in the past, but also seems like it's other areas of DOE might also be engaging with these like in transmission siting or renewable siting or fossil fuel shutdowns and that type of thing as well. Yeah, and I think I heard a little of that in the utility panel earlier today. There's a lot of discussion around that, that kind of lesson learning inside the renewable space as well. And I'll just say, you know, nuclear energy has dealt with this for a long time and has learned a lot of lessons that we're finally putting some positive action towards building that trust as an institution. And I think we can work together to kind of get all of that, you know, get everyone on board and build trust from the community. Great. Um, do we have another question on that side? Me? Yeah. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Thanks. Yeah, um, I've got two brief questions. Uh, the first is, uh, isn't the question of the safety of nuclear power can't that best be answered by the fact that there is no private insurance coverage available, whatever, for uh, nuclear power plants? It has to be insured by the uh, federal government. And then the second question is, do you happen to know anything about, uh, I've read about a process where energy can be produced using thorium. I was wondering if you knew anything about that. Thanks. Sure, I'll say, you know, from a safety perspective, it is certainly the case that nuclear plants are very large and they are covered by the Price-Anderson Act uh, from the uh, federal government. They basically have insurance with the federal government. It's a lot like the University of Wisconsin uh, insures the experiments on campus. The federal government, in a sense, insures nuclear reactors. Um, on the thorium side, I will say, yeah. Uh, so thorium is not a fuel. It is a fertile isotope. So you have to bombard it with neutrons to make it a fuel. It becomes uranium-233, and then that fissions. Um, there's lots of thorium out there in the world, just like there's lots of uranium. Thorium fuel cycles were studied in the United States in the 50s and um, continue to be studied inside my office in the fuel cycle uh, research and development area. 
A lot of people associate thorium with molten salt reactors, but I'll say that actually molten salt reactors can be fueled by either uranium or, or uh, thorium. And in fact, any thorium reactor has to be started with some uranium. So, uh, you know, I think the, the public perception is that thorium is amazing because it doesn't, it's a little lower on the uh, periodic table, and so it tends not to produce plutonium. The uranium-238 inside a normal reactor ends up as plutonium, and people associate plutonium with non-proliferation issues, with, you know, weapons. I will tell you, uranium-233 is exactly as proliferant in terms of its capability to uh, fuel a weapon as plutonium. And so I'll just say, like, you know, um, no single solution is ideal, but all fuel sources like this are a great option for the future of advanced reactors. But I think we need to be careful about what we hear and say. So speaking of thorium, is there, was there a demonstration plant in China or something? That, it just brings a question, to what extent does you know, DOE collaborate with Chinese efforts on, on nuclear, or is it more just monitoring what they're doing? or? Um, so the relationship with China internationally is changing somewhat. Um, there is a lot of general concern about um, uh, corporate espionage and whatnot, and this has affected the nuclear power industry. Uh, but historically, the United States has had collaborations with China, and in fact, there are multiple uh, American nuclear reactors in China, having been built by American companies. and. We have many Chinese researchers working together with us in our national laboratories and contributing to our mission. Um, but yeah, you know, how has it changed? I'll say there is a, a particular attention at this time around um, cor corporate espionage that makes it a little more difficult. Great, thanks. I think we've got one or two back there. Yeah. I have a question regarding the uh, permanent disposal of spent fuel. Is there, a, is there a location and is it active? Um, right now, the only permanent location for spent nuclear fuel is for um, not the commercial industry. It's the waste isolation pilot plant, um, WIP. And it is operating and has been operating for decades, but it is not the destination for commercial spent nuclear fuel. There is currently no destination for commercial spent nuclear fuel because uh, Yucca Mountain was chosen um, without, you know, through a process that I think, you know, in retrospect, didn't incorporate a, enough inclusion and consent of the communities there. And so that is no, it's not, while it is technically a well evaluated, safe solution, the like, policy around this is not supportive of a future for that location and so it is off the table we need consent from any community that's going to host a spent nuclear fuel repository and that uh and nevada is not interested in having yucca mountain on you know and so that's it so that is off the table right now the nuclear waste policy act constrains my office to uh, only consider yucca mountain and since it's off the table we are not considering it uh, Congressional direction is required. Uh, so uh, it would be very helpful to see congressional direction enable my office to consider other options that could arise out of a more consent-based process in this country. I think we have another question back. Oh, stuck up behind me. Um, I have a question about climate change and nuclear power from a totally different angle, and that is, I'm wondering how the anticipated impacts of climate change are affecting decisions about building and siting and maybe even decommissioning nuclear power plants. So the context of this is that I study sea level rise and climate change. I just moved here from Florida. So I'm thinking Turkey Point nuclear reactor, reinvesting in that extremely invulnerable site to sea level rise. But it strikes me there's a really unique challenge here because Nuclear power plants almost by definition have to be sited next to bodies of water because of the cooling, right? And so there are a lot of these sitting on vulnerable coastlines and I'm wondering, I'm sure DOE is thinking about this and looking at scenarios, but like are there plans to decommission plants that are in particularly vulnerable areas or how are you grappling with that challenge? Even inland, you might expect big changes in precipitation one way or the other that will make operating these sites very difficult. Yeah, so nuclear reactors are indeed often on bodies of water. Though it is interesting to note 
that our largest reactor, uh, our largest nuclear plant, Palo Verde, is uh, nowhere near any body of water. Anyway, very exciting. Um, there's so let's. It's there is a lot of assessment on what it's going to look like as we sort of as we have you know climate change impacting sea levels and whatnot. But it's also important to note that uh, nuclear reactors are uh, robust and regulatory regulated to be quite far um, that, you know, usually there's like a channel and, you know, the, it, there's a lot of leeway right now so that it won't be any kind of immediate change. If anything, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission continues to reevaluate all licenses in the context of existing weather and climate changes. Um, the water levels nearby are always reevaluated, and um, so you can rest assured that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is in sort of constant observance of the current state, and in the long term, the sort of federal government is interested in making sure that there is a safe operational plan for all of the reactors in all locations. Um, I'll say our hope is to not decommission any reactors that can stay, safely remain online um, because they are needed for climate avoidance, uh, climate change avoidance. Great, thanks. I think we've got an online question. Yeah, we have a question from Angela via Zoom. She asks, what concerns do you have for the extractive process of obtaining uranium and the environmental impacts and impacts to the people involved in the mining process? The mining process for uranium has had really detrimental impacts in you know the longer term history um, towards a lot of the communities around it. Uh, a lot of that uranium initially, actually the large vast majority of it was, was mined really in the earlier days of um, you know, weapons production, and um, it was it, a lot of uranium was mined early on, and then we built up a large stockpile that we're now drawing down on. Um, mining is very different today than it was then. I will share with you that there is some very important technology that has really transformed what it looks like to mine uranium. It's called in situ leaching, and you wouldn't even notice it from the surface. Uh, there's a, you know, um, Fluid is pumped down, new fluid is pumped up. It's not at extraordinary high pressures or anything like fracking. It's, uh, and it's, it's pumped back up with uranium in it and you extract it in this liquid. Um, it's much less environmentally problematic and uh, we are certainly looking towards future, any kind of future extraction process that may be needed when we you know, draw down the existing uranium in the United States. We are looking towards a future in which more environmentally sound practices are used rather than the kind of um, you know open pit type mining or, or uh, mined um, underground mining that has been used in the past. I think those kinds of in situ leaching processes are much more environmentally friendly and of course consent is a huge part and environmental justice and energy justice of the communities around it are important to the Department of Energy and will be incorpor incorporated in these decisions. Now of course there's also a commercial industry that has to be engaged with. You know, we in the Department of Energy don't decide where a mine is. It's like a capitalist nation. And so we have to work with industry to make sure that they recognize these values too and incorporate incentives. Excuse me. <clears throat> I've been talking a lot. <laughs> incorporate incentives to ensure that they have a reason to be more environmentally sound and environmentally just. I got to spend some of my kindergarten in Saskatchewan, Canada, because my father was working on construction of a uranium mine around there. So <laughs> the pleasure of doing that. The highest grade ore is in Canada, in the world. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll just, one more question for you. If we're thinking about the Biden's targets for 2035 and for 2050 and the urgency that you've mentioned, what are reasons to be optimistic that we can meet those targets that will rise to the challenge of the, of the urgency? I'll say that I think we have a real opportunity in the infrastructure bill to internalize a lot of the externalities of carbon emissions into the economics of climate change, into the economics of energy production, not just for renewables and energy efficiency, but also for nuclear. There are some, you know, economic um, policy choices in that bill that can enable us to bring those externalities into the economics of our energy production system. And that is a move that we really haven't seen at the federal level until now. And I think it makes a huge difference. Um, and I think it's a real signal that we're serious. Uh, yeah. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Huff, for coming back to Madison and sharing your insights and, and doing what you do as well. So, thanks. thanks for having me. Yeah.
And just to wrap up, I just want to thank a few people. I want to thank all of the panelists that we've had today. I want to thank the, the committee that helped us plan, the staff that made this all work. There was a time about a month ago where it was really a question about whether, how, and when maybe we would do this actual conference. And I'm just so impressed with how the, the staff has really charged through, did the investment and the effort to make it hybrid so that it would work in any conditions and that people could participate whether in person or online. I have to say this is the first kind of large gathering conference that I've participated in in the last year and a half and it's been such a pleasure and so energizing to, to be with people. And uh, so I really appreciate that. So please, a round of hand for uh, the panelists and the, the staff. Here. Three more things. Um, just a reminder to please complete the post-event survey so we can collect data on how to improve events in the future. So that's on the, the link that's on your tables there. Um, second, please join us for our next La Follette Forum on American Power, Prosperity, and Democracy. And that'll be at Monona Terrace in 2022. And you can go on the La Follette website to, to learn about more about that and how to, how to sign up for it. And then finally, we had, like I said, many contingency plans for this conference, one of which was for bad weather. Thankfully, we have gorgeous weather. And so our award and our prize for getting that is to go outside and go up one level to the third story terrace. So we're on the second floor, go up one level to the third floor, and we'll have drinks, appetizers, and chances for networking in the beautiful Madison fall weather that I'm so glad you could come back and participate in. So we'll see you upstairs in just a few minutes.